every now and then something very special has come into the shop. And, uh, you know, it's fairly infrequent. I mean, a lot of people think everything we do is special, but, you know, after your 16th or 17th 57 Chevy, you start thinking, well, you know, as nice as they are, here's another one. But on occasion, something special happens. And, uh, you know, this happened to me a few years ago when uh, an acquaintance of ours phoned me up and said, listen, uh, we have some cars for sale in Japan. Uh, there's an old Alpha there or a couple of them that would you be interested in? So, I thought, well, you know, I wouldn't personally be interested in them, but I may have some clients. So I phoned around, and, and um, one of my clients said, yes, indeed, he was interested in the office. Uh, get some information on them in a ring. So we did, and then, uh, you know, he paid a for, sort of a nominal sum, and uh, they started on their trek from, from Japan. I'm Dave Granger. I'm the president of the Guild of Automotive Restorers, a restoration company that's been in business for over 30 years. We have restored over 2,500 cars, trucks, and other vintage vehicles. If you're curious about what goes on behind the scenes of a large restoration shop, join us at the Guild's Classics. As we pulled open the container, my thoughts when I looked in, because there was a pile of aluminum rubble. <laughs> you know, literally, there was nothing left of this car. And, you know, we had bought it because there was two Alphas, and there was one called a Frecchia Doro. Uh, which is Golden Arrow in Italian. And, you know, it was a coupe, and it was a nice car, and, and I thought, well, between the two of them, we've got this much in parts. When that container opened, I thought, oh my God, we don't have anywhere near the value in parts. So we pulled it out, and, uh, you know, the car was just miserable, the, the, the primary car. The other one wasn't too bad. It was moldy and everything, but it was complete. But restored, it was worth about the same as the, uh, the entire sum paid. So I was a little disappointed. And then we started to look into this roadster, and it had been attributed to a coach builder in Italy post-war, and, uh, you know, and that was all very interesting. But as I researched it, I found it wasn't an unknown coach builder built it, it was Panin Farina. So we started looking into it, and then we discovered something very, very important, and that was in 1945 and 1946, the French weren't very happy with the Italians for obvious reasons. They had the Paris Salon 1946, and they weren't going to allow any German cars or Italian cars or J Japanese cars in to the Salon, which is understandable. Battista Farina, who had a company called Panin Farina, had had his company going since before the war, but I mean, the war had sort of gutted the entire industry, and the coach building was on its way out because of American mass marketing and mass production. He had conceptualized a car during the war. He had a client, Madame Tortoli, who was a perfumier in Milan, she wanted him to build her a special car, so he set about building it. He used a, a military chassis that had been sent, they wanted a, like a staff car built on it or something. It had been sent to him in 1941 or 1942. He had it in the shop. He started building this dramatic car, sort of the, all the ideas he had during the war when he was so constrained and couldn't build neat stuff. In 1945, 1946, he got it finished and he delivered it and uh, it went to some concours events, which were more fashion shows than car shows in those days, but it did very well. And uh, when he got it back in, in, uh, into his shop, he asked Madame Tortoli if it'd be all right if he drove the car to Paris to put it in the Paris Salon. And she, she was fine with that. So he got his son together with a couple of journalists, and they took two cars, uh, the uh, 6C 2500 Alpha and uh, a Lancia, and they drove them from Turin all the way to Paris, which was quite a trek in, in uh, cars that were you know, fairly slow. And especially you know, the roads in those days, there were no super highways. I mean, they were just still recovering from the war. So it was a long and arduous trek. When they got to Paris, he presented very proudly this really dramatic car to the authorities who said, you're not coming in. They just absolutely disallowed him to come into the Paris alone. So he and his son retired to a friend's place and they thought, well, what the hell are we gonna do? and they decided that they were gonna drive the car to the uh, Grand Palais and park it out right in front of the venue, right at the base of the stairs up to the, to the front doors. And they were gonna do that in the dark, first thing in the morning. So they spent the night cleaning the car, got, got it ready, along with the Lancia, and they drove them and they parked them in front of the Grand Palais, and they did that every single morning of the show. The show's promoters were absolutely livid. I mean, they were furious with him. Uh, they, they basically said, uh, that devil Batista, but the media loved him, and the, every person who went to the Paris Salon that year had to walk by the car in order to get in. And people loved it. The media just couldn't stop talking about it. They called it uh, Batista Pinin's 
Petit uh, Salon, and uh, the car was a hit. So much so that the organizers of the Paris Salon finally gave up and said, you know what, next year, you're gonna be right in the middle. They basically awarded him a spot right in the middle of the Paris Salon, and that made his name as a coach builder. You know, without this specific car, there would have been no Panin Farina. And if there's no Panin Farina, that means probably 90% of the Ferrari's designs since uh, the 40s wouldn't exist because Panin Farina designed it. Designed cars for General Motors, for Ford, for almost every car manufacturer have Panin designed cars. So this one car established Panin Farina as a major coach builder that survived the war. Most of the others didn't. If that is all the car had done, that would be quite enough, wouldn't it? But it did more than that. It was sold off not too long after that. It was bought by the managing director of Austin in England. And he loved the car and he drove it personally, but more importantly, he used the car as a design mule for the Austin A90 Atlantic, which was being built at that time to try to capture some of the American market. There was no European market for cars in those days. They were, as I said, they were in rubble, but the Americans had lots of money and they were thriving. So. Austin went, well, we got to sell cars in the United States. They needed a car that was sort of tight to what Americans would, would uh, want to drive. To that end, they hired uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Cotto, and uh, Holden Cotto. He worked with Raymond Lowy, who was famous for designing Studebakers, and some very, very interesting cars. And he went to England, was attached to Austin. He was working with them. He fell in love with the car. They had finished sort of using it as a design mule by that time. And uh, he bought it for a thousand pounds, and that was almost a gift because at the time it was still worth six or seven thousand pounds. If you think about that in the late 1940s, that's a lot of money. He took it back to the United States. Well, it was in shipment, uh, it was being lifted out of the, off the ship down, and, the, and uh, the car was quite badly damaged front and back by ropes and chains. And um, the car went directly from the docks to Raymond Lowy's garage. And Raymond Lowy and Holden uh, Cotto worked on this car personally to fix it. He ended up painting it green instead of the, the bronze that it had been. And then it began a life in America. Mercedes later on claimed that they had the splash guards, which are uh, over the wheel arches, front and back on the 300 uh, Mercedes uh, SLs, you know, li literally the gull wings and the roadsters. This car had those 10 years before. So, I mean, it, it, it was new to this car, it certainly was probably seen by Mercedes designers, and they went, oh, that's a good idea. Uh, another car that's inspired uh, was the Austin Healey. And if you look at this car, it is basically it looks like a giant Austin Healey from the side. So, you know, very, very significant car. Sometime during its travels in the States and changing hands, it became lost. It ended up engineless in a shop in California that went uh, out of business. It was called Hill and Vaughn. And Phil Hill, the famous racing car driver, was one of the partners. They weren't doing so well, they closed the shop. The contents were sold, and a gentleman by the name of Tamagawa in Japan bought all the contents of Hill and Vaughn and had them shipped, and, and this car, as a wreck, went to Japan. Tamagawa had quite a few cars, and uh, you know, uh, he had some projects that, that he was really enjoying doing. This wasn't on the list. When I saw photographs of it, it was parked in the corner of a, a, a large garage, basically in a pile with all whatever parts it had piled on top of it, with the Frecciadoro right next to it. It was just a mess. So we bought it, and you know, the rest is basically history. I mean, we did a, a very extensive restoration. The chap who purchased it and had us restoring it for him insisted that we keep as much of the original coachwork as possible. Now, this is an all aluminum car, and it was put together by people who were really inexpert. Uh, I don't think that there was a lot of uh, old coach builders around in 1946 in Italy. So you can see there was a lot of just very, very poor quality work. And the quality of the aluminum itself is very bad. And, and, and I have joked about it, but I actually think it's true that probably the aluminum in this car was recovered from the drop tanks from American fighters and bombers. You know, the Americans used to rain these huge aluminum drop tanks uh, everywhere they went. As soon as they ran out of fuel or went into combat, the aircraft would release the drop tank and it would just fall to the earth. And the, uh, the Axis uh, powers used to recover them and reuse the aluminum. Very likely, most of this car was hanging under a P-51 or a P-38 at some time in its life. The trouble with that was it was very poor quality aluminum, and we had a lot of corrosion, a lot of time damage that we had to deal with, and the constraint of having to use as much as was possible to use. So it, it took the restoration to completely new realms, because we had to find ways of preserving this old rotted aluminum and, and uh, a lot of the components. And 
One of the things that we wanted to do was preserve the historical integrity of a car. You know, it's one thing to restore a car and replace everything and make it all shiny and new, but sometimes you want people to be able to see how the original car was built. This car had very poor welding, for instance. It was all spattered and had very, virtually no strength. Somebody who was very inexpert at welding had put it together. I wanted to make sure that people knew that was the original welding. And it wasn't the welding we did either. So what I would do is we would take our modern style flow welding and we would run it along and just up and over some of the old welds. So always leaving an index of something very old and, and not particularly good underneath or next to something that was new. So once we got the car finished, it went to Pebble Beach. Didn't do very well there. And I think, you know, the judges, you know, they liked the car, but they, I don't think they understood it. I mean, they, they didn't spend a lot of time because they don't have a lot of time, but you know, one of them made the comment that, oh my God, that dashboard's awful. That can't possibly be original and yet it's one of the most stunningly beautiful dashboards I've ever seen. But he said, there's too much chrome, it would, it would be too shiny. Well, only if the sun is shining off the floorboards. But, um, you know, the other thing in that, we had photographs taken in 1946 and 47 uh, of this, parts of this dashboard. We didn't change anything. Madame Tortoli had designed a lot of this car herself, or her influence the design. And that was the dashboard. We had enough of the original to, to absolutely determine what it was like. The steering wheel was a real problem for us because it didn't exist. It wasn't on the car, and we didn't have any clear photographs. Every, every photograph we had, there was somebody sitting in the car, so they were eclipsing most of the wheel. It took two years. We finally found a photograph of this car where we could see three quarters of the wheel. Then we spent another year looking for one. It turned out this wheel was called anti-seismic because there was a rubber ring to stop vibration reaching your hands. It didn't exist. There were other ones that were similar, but we couldn't do similar. We had to do exact. So the guys here, Kalev uh, on staff and Thomas and that, carved this wheel and uh, hand stitched the leather onto it, even created the, uh, the logos and everything that are in the uh, new site. So, you know, a magnificent job. Then Kalev, we couldn't, couldn't get a radio, so Kalev made the radio, which I thought was very clever of him. You know, the next show, major show we took it out to was the uh, Concours at Villa d'Este, Lake Como in Italy. There's only 50 cars a year invited to this, and uh, it, it, in my opinion, is probably the most Im important and influential Concours in the world. Putting Pebble aside, this one's the oldest, and it is really very special. We took this car there, and the moment it appeared, the Italians went nuts. As a matter of fact, the people from Panin Farina didn't know the car still existed, knew all about the car, but had no idea where it had gone. So they were just you know, over the moon about the fact that here it is. The members of the family that found Alfa Romeo, there was quite a few of them there, they went nuts over the car. Despite what a couple of the judges in Pebble Beach said about the interior, it won most elegant interior at, uh, at Lake Como, which is a you know, very significant award. We were beyond pleased. Since that time, it has done very well for itself. It's also been exhibited to me, more importantly, in art museums. For what it is, it is a magnificent art piece. And unlike many of these you know, cars that are sort of more art than competent cars, driving this car is a joy. I mean, it, is, it drives beautifully. I won't say like a modern car, but certainly not like just about all the other cars. So as far as a masterful piece of design, the blending of a, a beautiful drive line with an exquisite body, I don't think you can get any better than this car. In my opinion, and I think the opinion of quite a few other people, this is probably one of the most important cars post-war uh, that's still in existence. I mean, you see lots of prototypes and everything, but there's not too many cars built by a coach builder that have had an influence on so many other cars. The fact that it looks 1960s or 1970s contemporary is a tribute to how far in advance it was that he prophesied and influenced cars that would come later.